I don't know if you've ever put it in these words or not, but in some way, in some fashion, we've all probably asked the question, uh, what is God like? Or, uh, wanting to know how God works, or how God responds, or what God does. And, uh, even as far back as uh, the, when the apostles were walking with Jesus, we looked at last week the passage of Scripture where Jesus uh, told them that He was the way, the truth, and the life. And Philip said, Lord... Uh, let's cut to, cut to the chase and you show us God and, and that will satisfy us inside. I mean, that will that'll satisfy our faith and, and keep us going and, and we'll be able to do all that you'd have us to do. Well, Jesus' response was, Philip, duh, I've been with you now for how long? We've been walking together for three years and we've been talking together and You've watched the miracles that I've done and you've heard every word that I've said. And, and Philip, don't you understand that I and God are one? I mean, the words that you've heard me speak, that was God. And the miracles that you heard and saw me perform, that was God. And the things that you saw me do, that, that was God. Because I am the Father, are one. We are under the same authority. I mean, I am under... God's authority as I, as I come. Philip, don't you understand? Don't you get it? You know, when you think about the fact that God sent Jesus into the world, what a wonderful thought that is, right? But He sent Jesus into the world. Why? Well, first thought that came to my mind when I asked that question was so I could be saved. How about you? It was so that I could know the Lord Jesus Christ is my personal Savior so that I could uh, uh, have my sins forgiven. But, but if that were the only reason Jesus came, then why didn't He just come into the world, go to the cross and die, and then on the third day rise again and go back to heaven? There were other things that God did with the fact that Jesus came to earth. One of the things was is so that we could have a glimpse of God so that we could see God and know God, and so that we could, could, could uh, hear from God and, be, and see God demonstrated among us so we could know more about God. What we learn about God comes from Jesus and Jesus' life here on, on the earth. Now, when you study the four Gospels, and I hope you have, four Gospels are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, those first four books of the New Testament. When you study those four Gospels, it is that they're called Gospels because they record the life and ministry of Jesus. So when you look at them, ask yourself the question as you get through reading, what did I learn about God from what I just read? In the life of Jesus, what did I learn about God? Well, looking at God, God chose to become a human he chose to become one of us. He says in John chapter 1, verse 18, No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, He has declared it. So what John said there, remember John's an eyewitness. He saw Jesus. He talked to Jesus. He saw Him put Him on the cross. He saw Him die. He saw Him put Him in the, the, the tomb. And he came back and he actually went inside the tomb and was able to say that Jesus was gone. I saw that he was gone. I know they put him here and he's not here now. And John, as an eyewitness, writes down exactly what he saw. So this eyewitness says, you know, nobody has ever seen God. But we've seen Jesus. And we've seen God through Jesus. He has declared it. Well, this morning I want us to look at a story from one of the four Gospels. The four Gospels, again, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I want us to continue in John and his, his uh, eyewitness account. John chapter 9 says, Now as Jesus passed by, He saw a man who was blind from birth. And His disciples asked Him, saying, Rabbi or teacher, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? 
Now there was a, a teaching, uh, the, the thought was that any time something went wrong with a person, or any time something was wrong with a person, is because someone sinned. So his disciples asking like they were taught, you know, this guy was born blind, so somebody must have sinned. Jesus, did he sin before he was born? Or was it his mother and dad, one of them who sinned, that caused him to be blind? Now there's something wrong with that assumption. And Jesus continues, Jesus begins to teach on this. This is a lot of Scripture this morning, but I want us to, to learn from this, learn something about God and about the nature of God. Jesus answered, talking about whose sin causes this guy to be blind, neither this man nor his parents sin, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. There's something real interesting here. Jesus said, your theology is way off base. You know something, when we get to heaven, I think we're going to find that a lot of our theology is way off base. He said, what you've been taught all your life isn't necessarily so. I probably have told you that when I was in college in Jacksonville, Texas, I was a member of a little church here, Travis Street Baptist Church, and we went out visiting one day and knocking doors. And we went to a house and knocked the door, and a guy came to the door, and I told him we were from Travis Street Baptist Church. He said, oh, I'm a member of Travis Street Baptist Church. Never seen the guy before. And then he went on to say, of course, I hadn't been there in 30 years, but, but I'm a member of that church down there. And we began to talk, and, and I asked him why he wasn't going to church, and uh, we'd like to have him back, and uh, invited him to come back. We were having a revival, I believe it was, and invited him to come to the revival. And he said, well, I guess you wonder why I hadn't been in church. And I said, yes, that had run through my mind. I wondered what kept you out for 30 years. And he said, well, he said, you know, I believe like the Bible teaches is that we are to eat, drink, and be merry because we don't have very long on this earth. And that's what I do every weekend. I eat, drink, and I be very merry So before I go back to work on Monday. And I said, I'd like to see that verse of Scripture in your Bible and see what Jesus is talking about when, when, that, verse is, is being, when that verse is said there. He said, I don't know where it's there, but I heard my mama say it, so I know it's got to be, uh, that, that's the way it's got to be. I think when we get to heaven, there's going to be a lot of screwy theology, right? A lot of things that we thought was right. And, and this was a screwy theology. But sometimes we think that ourselves, don't we? Through the years, I've had many people ask me, if they had a special needs child, what did we do that caused God to send that special needs child in our house? I have a real good friend that uh, his daughter is well into her uh, mid-twenties now. And I heard him not long ago make a statement that he's still dealing with that in his mind, what he and his wife, one of them, must have done that caused her to be born that way. Jesus said it was neither of the parents nor him. He was teaching us a picture of a characteristic of God Himself. Sometimes when there is pain and suffering, there is no reason at all as far as anybody having sin. It is not punishment. It is for the glory of God. And that's exactly what Jesus says right here. He says, neither this man nor his parents sin. But listen to this. Read on what he says. But that the works of God should be revealed in him. This young man's pain and suffering because of his blindness and the pain and suffering that his parents uh, were experiencing because this special needs child in their life, that it was there for a reason so that God could get glory. Many times pain and suffering comes to us. Many times there are things that we face and maybe the thought runs through your mind, God is trying to tell me something. God is trying to punish me for something. There's something that, that I need to understand from this. And sometimes there is. But many times 
It is that God wants to do something and God can use your pain and suffering for His honor and glory. You say, now wait a minute, that blows a hole in my theology. If it does, your theology isn't worth 15 cents. It's wrong. The Bible plainly says, Jesus plainly teaches, that there sometimes people go through pain and suffering so that others could see God. You can sit in a service and hear a good message and the Spirit of God can grab your heart and it can make a, a life-changing difference. But as you watch someone who's going through pain and suffering, who, who through the struggles they might be having with their child, or through some very difficult uh, uh, health issues that, that may be over a long period of time and you know that they have suffered and you know that there is pain there or, or may have caused financial uh, uh, problems or, or it may be that they went to the job and they got their job and, and had a real secure job and were, were doing very well but lost their job. But through the pain and suffering that this person is going through, you see a calm assurance come over them. You see some strength that you've never seen before. You see something happening in their life when, when, when their life is crumbling around them that, that you just don't sense in your own life. That speaks volume of the power of Almighty God. That God is greater than circumstances and God is greater than situations. That God is greater than the pain that you are bearing. Many times I have heard people say, and I have thought to myself about a situation that somebody is going through, I don't think I could handle that. I don't believe that I could go through that. I don't believe that I could handle the cancer. I don't believe I could handle... Uh, uh, the having my child go through that or, or, or dealing with my child. I don't think I could handle uh, bankruptcy because I lost my job or I don't think I could handle the situation. But if you look how God dealt in their life, if you know the Lord Jesus Christ is your personal Savior, you can rest assured that whatever happens in life, you can handle it when it comes. There is the hand of God. There is the strength of God. There is the presence of God that can, can work in your life and give you strength when you don't have strength. And when you see that exhibited in someone who is going through the pain and suffering. You see the glory of God. You say, how cruel. No, it's not. There is nothing more precious than the hand of God. There is nothing sweeter than, than, than the presence of God in an absolutely helpless situation and you feel the power of God carrying you through. And then on the other side of that, to understand that I may be going through pain and suffering, and you may be going through pain and suffering, but there is a purpose through the pain and suffering. If God can get honor and glory, every bit of it's okay. Right? So God says, you don't understand, fellas. It's not that He's being punished because of sin, it is so that God can get honor and God can get glory from His life. Actually, some 2,000 years later, God's still getting honor and glory through His life, isn't He? I mean, it's recorded for all times and we're still able to see glimpses of God through the story of this young blind man. Well, it goes on. Here is what we can learn about God. One of the three things I want to share with you this morning. We can learn about God through Jesus in this story. God sometimes chooses to display His power through our pain. Think of that. 
God sometimes chooses to display His power through our pain. Well, when he had said these things, he spat on the ground and made clay with the slough. And he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. Now, I love this. I love to think about this. Jesus and his disciples standing here, across the road over there, there's this blind man. He's begging. He's probably kind of dirty because he's uh, uh, coming on these dirty roads and been sitting there for a while alongside the road. And there he is on the other side of the road, and they're questioning Jesus about the, the blind man, why he's blind. Jesus just made a very important point to him, something that we can learn from, that God sometimes uses pain in order to get glory through our lives. And all of a sudden, Jesus stops, he bends down, and <laughs> spits on the ground. And then he reaches down where he spit on the ground and gets some of the mud in both of his hands. <laughs> he walks across the street to where this blind man's sitting, plant right on his eyes. The mud, the spit, right in his eyes. Now can you imagine what that blind man's thinking? What's happening? What on earth is going on? I don't know this guy. And he just spit on the ground. I heard him. It was loud. He spit on the ground and here he comes with mud and spit and put in my eyes. And he said to him, Go and wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sin. So he went and washed and came back seeking. The guy... The blind man, the stranger he'd never seen before, spit in the dirt, put the spit in the dirt in his eyes, and then tells him to go down to the pool of Siloam and wash. I imagine the guy's thinking something like this. Well, i got to go wash my face now anyway. i got spit and dirt in it. i got to get, get clean. Uh, so I, I'm ready to go. Somebody had to carry him. He was blind, right? carried him down to the water, and he put his hands down in the water and, and, and scooped up some water in both hands, and he washed his eye, got all the dirt out. Now imagine he has been blind all of his life. He has never seen anyone or anything. He's never seen the water that he's washing his face in. <laughs> that may have been a blessing. But he's never seen the water that he's washing his face in. He's never seen his buddies that have carried him around from place to place. He, he did not see the face of Jesus. He's gone now. Uh, he's walked on he, after he talked to him. But he heard him speak. He felt the, the dirt in his eyes, but, but he, he didn't see the face of Jesus at that time. So he bends over into the water, washes his eyes, and when he sits up again, he sees the sky. He sees light for the very first time. He sees the birds flying across the sky. He turns and sees his best buddy John, or whoever his best buddy was, who, who was leading him around. And man, you're ugly. And, and then turns around and looks at all the other guys with him. He looks at the dirt. He looks at the water. He looks around at the trees and the grass and the flowers. It's something brand new, something he had never seen before. And at this time, he went over there blind, but this time he's come back seeing I can tell you that this made a profound difference in his life. Right? Isn't that what Jesus does when He touches us? Even though we don't understand it always, doesn't it always make a profound difference? Well, it went on. Some said, this is He. You know how people talk, right? There they are downtown and the gossip sections are going on. You got the gossip group come in. Here comes a guy that went over there blind. Somebody spitting his in dirt and putting his eyes and he went over there to the water and washed it. And he was blind. We saw him lead over there and then somebody here he comes back and he's walking on his own and he's talking and it's very evident that he can see. Some of them, some of them say, is this the same guy that went down there? Others, some of them say, yeah, yeah, that, that's him. Others are saying, no, it's just somebody who looks like him. It's not really him. And he said, you guys are crazy. It's me. I'm the same guy I used to be, but now I see. It's me. 
So they said uh, to him, How were your eyes open? I don't know. Somebody spit on the ground, put the mud in my eyes, told me to go down to the uh, pool and wash my eyes. I went down to the pool and washed my eyes. He said I'd come back seeing. I didn't understand what he meant. But as soon as I opened my head, my eyes, and, and lifted my head, I saw sun for the very first time. I saw people for the very first time. I saw the city for the very first time. I couldn't see, but then I could see. That's all I know. He answered him and said, A man called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes, and he said to me, Go to the pool of Siloam and wash. So I went and washed, and I received my sight. Then they said to him, Where is he? He said, I don't know. I didn't see where he went. He was blind. He didn't see where he went. <coughs> He said, I don't know which direction he went to. I don't know where he, what happened to him. They brought him, him who formerly was blind, to the Pharisees. And that was really interesting. Anytime a miracle happened, it had that person involved in the miracle had to be carried down to the leaders in the temple to verify. Anytime anyone had leprosy, and the leprosy went away or, or the leprosy was healed or cleansed, they had to be carried up to the temple and the temple uh, officials had to say, alright, he's clean. He can, he can come back to the temple. He can live in town now. So they brought this guy who was blind and brought him in to, and set him before the temple officials. The, the fair, happened to be Pharisees. And, and they said, alright, this is what happened. Now it was a Sabbath when Jesus made the clay and opened His eyes. Then the Pharisees also asked Him again how He received His sight, and He said to them, He put clay on my eyes, and I washed, and I see. Therefore some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, because he does not keep the Sabbath. Others said, how can a man who is a sinner do such signs? And there was a division among them. <laughs> there are some people, there are some people who are probably members of New Hope Baptist Church because there are some people who are members of churches all across America, probably around the world, who a miracle could come up and slap you upside the head and you wouldn't recognize it. God still performs miracles, doesn't He? There are still miracles going on. Well, they're in the church. They had their preconceived ideas. And immediately, this guy's talking about how he was blind, but the shackles came off his eyes and now he could see. And they're arguing about, uh-oh, this was on the Sabbath. If it's done on the Sabbath, it couldn't have been a miracle. You just think you can see, you really can't, because that couldn't have been a miracle. Their preconceived idea was, if Jesus really was of God, He never would have done it this way. They had their system, their theology, they had their thoughts all down in a box. Everything worked this way. If it doesn't work this way, it can't be of God. But they were wrong. It was of God. And because it was of God, they thought if He did it on the Sabbath, there's no way that God would ever move on the Sabbath. You know, sometimes miracles happen in a lot of ways. I've seen folks, the doctor said you've got cancer. Matter of fact, I know of several cases where they went right up into surgery time and did a pre-surgery x-ray or, or whatever kind of exam they were. And the doctor come back and say, I don't know how to explain this, but 
It's not there anymore. It's gone. There have been those who cancer went through a surgery. And through the surgery, the cancer was removed and, and no longer there. There have been those that, that, that have taken medication and the medication, uh, they come back after giving the medication and, and the cancer is gone. In my opinion, all three are miracles. Who gave us chemotherapy? Smart men and women? No, they, they found it and put it together. But, but who gave us the original elements here on this earth and gave us the knowledge to know how to put them together and, and allowed it to come out and allowed it to do something? That had to be God, didn't it? Who gave us the ability to have... You know, I was talking to the, the doctor about a heart transplant here just last week. And he, that, that was nothing. He said, we go in, he said, you'll be in the ICU for three days, and he said, then you'll be in the hospital for about a week after that, he said, then you get out of the hospital, and, and you'll have to stay in the, uh, close to the hospital for a couple of weeks just to make sure you're not rejected or any kind of infection, but then you go back to work, and you go back like, like, like life, you know, like, like it's nothing. He said, you'll feel better than you felt in a whole lot of years, just like that, that's nothing putting a, a, a heart in there, like it's nothing treating cancer like it's nothing having something done. But isn't that a miracle of God? Isn't life in His hand? And you see, that's the, a lesson He is teaching us. A lesson He is teaching us. Well, they went on to say to the blind man again, what did you say about him because he opened your eyes? I bet the blind man threw up his hand. Well, is he's a prophet? I don't know who he is. I don't know what he was. But the Jews did not believe him, believe concerning him, that he had been blind and received his sight until they called the parents of him who had received his sight. He doesn't fit in our mold. He doesn't fit into what our preconceived ideas of what God can do and what God will do or who God will do it with. Sometimes our preconceived ideas deal with who it is. Isn't it? That person has lived a rough life and God wouldn't do that in their lives. That person has lived a really good life that... That, that, that pain and suffering wouldn't come in their life. And they ask Him, saying, Is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he see? His parents answered them and said, We know that this is our son, and we were there, believe me, we know he was born blind. But by what means now he sees we do not know. We don't know what happened. We know he was blind. We know now he can see. Or who opened his eyes? We don't know. He is of age. Ask him what happened. He'll speak for himself. His parents said these things because they feared the Jews, for the Jews had agreed already that if anyone confessed that he was Christ, he would be put out of the synagogue. Now, that's a real Christian thing to do. And we don't believe that... Actually, what they were saying was, is we don't believe in Christ. We don't believe that Christ was the Son of God. We believe because He's different than we thought He was going to be. He doesn't look like we thought He was going to look. He doesn't act like we thought He was going to act. He can't be the Son of God. And, and so, anyone who says anything about Christ can't be a part of our church. You just got to go on because you just don't meet our criteria. You know, the world has evolved to such a place like that today, right? I was reading something that Benjamin Franklin wrote uh, this last week. I love to read 
some of the, the forefathers and their writings. Oh, Ben Franklin talks about how it was that he knew in his heart a civilization couldn't last that didn't believe in God. He said there was democracy cannot exist where there is not the teachings of God or by the hand of God. A, 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 a true democracy will never exist without the kind of morality that's taught in Christianity. And you know something? He was absolutely right. We see it moving away from democracy, right? Freedoms. Because we're moving away from God. Well, in our preconceived ideas today, you can generically talk about God if you don't do it emphatically. But generically talk about God, but don't mention Christ. Because it doesn't fit the mold or the box that the world has drawn up about what God is. Oprah Winfrey will tell you that, yeah, you believe, she believes in God. God is anything you want Him to be. God is anything that you perceive Him to be inside. What means a lot to you in your heart, what it is that, that, that motivates you, that's your God. And that's who you should serve and that's who you should follow. She is wrong. Studied last week. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but how? But by me. So, the blind man. Parents knew they'd be thrown out of the sin of God, and that was a big thing. You say, so what? They might lose their job. They would lose a circle of friends. They probably would lose any kind of standing they might have in the community or any kind of help that they might have had in the community if they were thrown out of the synagogue. It was a big deal. Therefore, his parents said, he's of age, ask him. So they again called the man who was blind and said to him, Give God the glory. We know that this man is a sinner. Talking about Jesus. You say God did it, but don't tell us about this Jesus character. Don't you say that He had anything to do with the miracle that was performed. He answered and said, Whether He is a sinner or not, I do not know. One thing I know, it, this is a beautiful, beautiful verse. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. I'm not an expert on anything. I haven't studied in theological schools. I've not been a student of the, Bible, the, the scrolls for a long period of time. I'm not one that the world turns to look at when they have theological questions, he said. But let me tell you what I do know because I have experienced it. I was there. I know what happened. He said, I was a blind man. I've been blind all my life. I had never seen the color red. Ever. And I went down and washed my eyes like I was told, like Jesus told me to do. And when I washed my eyes and I looked up, I saw color for the first time. I was blind, but now I see. You can say whatever you want to, put any kind of theological term to it, but that's what happened to me. I experienced it. You ever talk to somebody that just got saved? You ask them, uh, how do you feel? They don't really know how to put it in words. I feel good. I feel happy. I, you know, trying to explain exactly what's what going on in their life. But you know what he's talking about. You know how he's feeling because you felt that way too. It is that, that feeling that, that those shackles, the blindness has been lifted and now you're able to see. Now that weight is gone. Now that, that, that burden is gone. That guilt is gone because of what Jesus has done in your life. You may not be a theologian. You may not be able to put it down in the treaties. But you know... It, you, all you know is, is before I asked Jesus into my heart, I was filled with guilt. There was no purpose or meaning in my life. And all that's gone. I opened my eyes and, and now I can really see. I know the truth. Yeah. 
Then they said to him again, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, Aren't you listening? I already told you my story once. I told you already, and did you not listen? Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become a disciple? I love this. Here they are, they're saying, we don't believe in Jesus, and anybody who believes in Jesus can't be a member of our church. And he says, why do you want me to repeat the story? Y'all want to start following Jesus too? Then they reviled Him. They made fun of Him. They called Him names and said, you are His disciple. You're going to follow Christ. We're not. We're Moses' disciple. We know that God spoke to Moses. As far as this fellow Christ, we don't know where he's from. The man answered and said to them, Why? This is a marvelous thing that you do not know where he is from, yet he has opened my eyes. He's saying, Experience speaks for himself. I don't know where, what his pedigree is, but I know what he did for me. You know, that's the testimony of a Christian. I don't know the process. I don't know all that there is to know about Jesus, but this one thing I know, I was lost in my sin and under the weight of the guilt and burden, and Jesus came into my life and He touched me, He washed me, with His blood. And when He washed me, I came out seeing for the first time a brand new creature because of what Christ has done. Now we know that God does not hear sinners. Talking about Jesus. But if anyone is a worshiper of God and does His will, He hears Him. Since the world began, it has been unheard of that anyone opened the eyes of one who was born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered and said to him, You were completely born in sins, and are you teaching us? They cast him out. How dare you come in here? You haven't studied at the right seminaries. How dare you come in here and try to tell us what to believe? We know what to believe. We'll tell you what to believe. I'm glad they weren't there when Jesus put the mud in his eyes, he'd have sat there and never washed it out, would he? Never followed what Jesus said. Second thing I want you to see here is God extends mercy beyond theology. You don't have to understand it to experience the mercy of God. Someone else doesn't have to be able to explain it to you. You may not, never fully understand the mercy of God. Why God loved you in spite of where you came from. Why God loved you in spite of what you've done. Why God provided and gave and blessed and touched and healed and done all the things inside your life in spite of what you've done inside of your life. God's mercy extends beyond theological thought. And the third point, and this is neat, God takes personal interest in individual people. Jesus heard that they had cast Him out, thrown Him out of church. And when He found Him, He said to him, Do you believe in the Son of God? He answered and said, who is He, Lord, that I may believe in? Show Him to Him. Show Him to Him. And Jesus said to him, You have both seen Him, and it is He who is talking with you. You experience the grace, the mercy of God through Me. Then He said, Lord, I believed, and He worshipped. If you're here today, and you're dealing with guilt in your life from something that's happened in your past, you just can't come up with the idea that God could love me because of how much sin has been in my life. And I'm guilty of it. Let me tell you, God's mercy extends beyond what we have done. There's only one criteria to come to God. 
And that's to come through Jesus. Jesus told us that if we were would confess our sins before Him, ask Him to forgive us of our sin, and believe with all of our heart that He'll do what He says He does. That's faith. Complete faith. Have that complete saving kind of faith. That He'll come into our heart and save us. And let me tell you something, Christian friend. Life is filled with all kind of experiences that you'll never understand. But if you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, wherever you are, whatever you are experiencing, no matter how painful it may be, there is a purpose in it and through it, and God will carry you through. Use it for God's honor and God's glory. Use it so that others can see the hand of God and glorify the God who, who is working in your life, who is sustaining you in your life, who gives you the strength to go on, who provides every need that you have so that they might be prepared when they face the challenges of life so that God could be glorified in what we are going through. Number one question, do you know Jesus Christ is your personal Savior? If you don't right now, it's time to square that off. Settle. Come to Christ as your Savior. Number two, if you do know Christ is your personal Savior, are you using your life where you are for Jesus? You say, well, Pastor, if I could just get out of this financial crunch, then I'd start serving the Lord. No, you wouldn't. You serve Him in the financial crunch. You let others see how God pulls you through. If I could just get that job, then I would serve Christ. You serve Him as you look for that job, as, as you're trying to find that job, and let Him supply it, then it's going to be right. It, when I get over this illness where I have the strength to do what He wants me to do, you let Him provide the strength you need through that illness and, and let others see the power of God. Where you are, 